The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Moving Beyond Off-Label Management in Parigo Nodularis, Exploring New Treatment Options. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash CDT 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Welcome to Moving Beyond Off-Label Management in Parigo Nodularis, Exploring New Treatment Options with Dr. Serena Elmaria and Sean Quatra. And these are our objectives tonight. So we're going to discuss the burden of disease and unmet needs for experienced by PN patients, talk about the growing understanding of PN pathophysiology and how that's contributed to new therapeutic strategies, and we're going to develop individualized treatment uh, plans following expert recommendations, also new current and emerging therapies. Also, we'll give you just our thoughts about it. So let's get started. Let's first zone in uh, to the pathophysiology of parigonagularis, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about the prevalence. So basically, we have really no idea how common this disease is. Before 2015, we didn't even have a diagnostic code. So all these patients just fell into, you know, atopic dermatitis, other, lichen simplex, chronicus, there's all these bucket conditions, so we actually have no idea how common it is. But in 2015, Prigonagularis got its own ICD-10 code, and we were able to start looking. And so in that first year, it looked like it was about 72 per 100,000. So, so that's around 87,000 cases, but we know that's a huge underestimate. When you look at each year, the number keeps going up. And what I say is there's been terrible disease uh, understanding, disease awareness, and now that that's improving, we can see that the prevalence counts are higher. I think the latest one was over three, almost 400,000. And my actual estimate would probably be between 500 to a million, 500,000 to a million people. One thing that's interesting about parigonagularis is it emerges uh, in adults more commonly, very uncommon in kids. I have a few uh, patients who are kids, but mostly emerges in adults and in middle age. So that's one of the big distinguishing features from atopic dermatitis as compared to psoriasis. This is a broad overview of pathophys, but basically just think about a few things. When I think about parigonagularis, I think about just two things first. Itch, and you can see this whole pathway from the skin to the dorsal ganglion and the spinal cord all the way up to the brain and back. That's important for itch. And then I think about this nodule. That's the most important distinguishing feature of parigonagularis from even atopic dermatitis or psoriasis. And then you have a whole lot of stuff going on. We know that there's the nerves that are hypersensitized. You have immune cells like eosinophils and mast cells, basophils, that are secreting a lot of these cytokines, and you're having crosstalk with these, uh, these cytokines in the nerves. And then there's other factors as well. We know that fibrosis is really important. We know that the blood vessels are very important as well. So these are all key features, but we'll walk you guys through it a little bit more. We're going to go to a video about the pathophys. Parigo nodularis, or PN, is a distinct chronic neural and immune-mediated skin disease characterized by intense itch and nodular lesions. As one of the itchiest skin conditions, PN is characterized by the development of a pathological itch-scratch cycle and neuronal sensitization, leading to disease chronicity independent of the initial disease triggers. Histological examination of PN lesional skin demonstrates dense infiltrates of eosinophils, T lymphocytes, and mast cells which release a wide range of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Eosinophils accumulate in the dermis of PN lesions, releasing the neuropeptides nerve growth factor and substance P, and exacerbate neurogenic pathways. Eosinophil cationic protein and eosinophil-derived neurotoxin eosinophil protein X the granular pro-inflammatory components of eosinophil cells are also upregulated in the upper dermis of PN lesions. Interleukin-4 and vasoactive intestinal polypeptide are additional eosinophilic contributors of PN pathogenesis. These pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrogenic cytokines induce pruritus and erythema of the lesions. T lymphocytes play an important role in pathogenesis through the release of interleukin-31 at the lesion sites. 
Increased IL-31 expression is strongly associated with itch and a wide range of pruritic skin diseases, with the relative highest expression found in the lesional skin of PN patients. Along with eosinophils and T lymphocytes, mast cells also help maintain the inflammatory response in PN, releasing histamine, prostaglandins, and other itch-mediating substances. Increased expression of the neuropeptide substance P and calcitonin gene-related peptide, neurotrophins such as nerve growth factor and endothelin support the notion of dysregulated neuroimmune epithelial crosstalk, also explaining the neuronal and epidermal hyperplasia of skin in patients with PN. In summary, though the exact pathogenesis of PN is unclear, it appears that increased activity of type 2 immune cells and cytokines along with certain other immune cells and inflammatory mediators, may contribute to signs and symptoms of PN through interactions with neurons and other dermal and epidermal resident cells. In line with a central role of Th2 cytokines, therapies targeting IL-4, IL-13, and IL-31 have demonstrated short and long-term efficacy in treating paragonodularis, offering new hope for improving patient care. Dupilumab, which inhibits IL-4 and IL-13 signaling, has been approved to treat PN. I, I want to take a poll and see how many of you ever at one point in your career or managing PN um, thought that it was purely a psychiatric disorder. Um, is there anybody here who actually thought that it was primarily just a picking or psychiatric disorder at any point? That's actually really, oh, okay. I mean, that, usually we get more people who think that that's the, you know, particularly people who've been managing this for a long time. And, and this idea that there is immune dysregulation, I guess I could ask that question one other way, which is how many of you knew there was such a heavy immune component to this disease? Great. So you recognize both. Good for you. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's something that I think really propels us into a different spectrum of when we're thinking about this disorder. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, that's more no, for me. <laughs> absolutely. So if we zone in, like really zoom into the nodule, you can see here a few things about what's going on. You have this dead layer of skin on top in the stratum corneum. You, know, have, you have pseudoepithelomatous hyperplasia and acanthosis. And then you also have a dense inflammatory infiltrate in the upper dermis. You have lymphocytes, eosinophils, neutrophils, mast cells, macrophages. And you also have fibrosis. So you can appreciate here some of that uh, collagen thickening and fibrosis. And these are all the different manifestations that we can see of paragonagularis. So you can see some of them are very exophytic, very hyperkeratotic, a lot of layer of skin and skin of color patients. Oftentimes there's dispigmentation that you can appreciate, that pink color. So that's why early treatment is very important because oftentimes we can't reverse that. So that's one of the biggest things, especially in skin of color patients. You want to treat folks very early. Then you have some folks who have flatter lesions. And I think that's where some of this confusion has come in with it being in folks' heads because one of the, the most important differential diagnoses with paragonodularis that comes up is excoriation disorder or I hate to say it because it's not really PC, but one of the words we use is neurotic excoriations. I actually put that in a chart once because it's the ICD-10 code, and the patient got upset, and I was like, you know, that's really a nice reason to be upset. You know, that's not very polite of, of us to write that. But excoriation disorder is different from paragonodularis because it doesn't usually have pruritus. It has, uh, you know, these excoriated uh, ulcerations that are maybe have pressure, maybe have tingling, all of those sensations. And what I've been surprised uh, and actually humbled a lot of times is folks who may look like excoriation disorder and you'd normally say, hey, go see a psychiatrist or psychologist, that they actually get better with, with immunomodulating therapies. What, what's been your experience? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's the same. I, I've, I guess I've never been in the camp that thinks PN specifically has been um, psychiatric, but many of my patient referrals have been for neurotic excoriation, body-focused repetitive behaviors, uh, things that don't acknowledge the actual understanding uh, and current understanding of the pathophysiology. And then one more thing I wanted to point out is there is incredible disease heterogeneity in so basically what we're saying 
falls into pyrigonagularis. It's something as small as a, like two to three millimeter small papules up to two to three centimeters, super exophytic fibrotic nodules. So in reality, I mean, they may even be all these different diseases, but we're lumping them all together because itch is a unifying feature and the nodules is a unifying feature. So you, these pictures help to, to show how much disease heterogeneity there can be. And other things about the nodules, they're usually symmetrically distributed on areas of the skin. Extremities are the most common areas, so upper and lower extremities. When we did a study, those were the most common areas where these nodules develop. Areas where you don't usually get pyrigonodularis, so the face, the palms, the soles, the scalp, and the genitals, all those areas are rarely affected. And adding to the complexity, it's not just nodules, so you can have signs of chronic scratching, excoriations, scars, Honestly, oftentimes when you see a lot of these bleeding areas and the skin being ulcerated, you know that the disease is very active. And because those areas are so excoriated and ulcerated, oftentimes you have other sensations. It's not just itch, it's burning sensations, it's stinging. Pain is a huge deal in pyrigonagularis as well that's underrepresented. And actually, folks don't talk about it a lot, but when we look under the microscope at these lesions, what you see is in the dermis, the nerves are very hypertrophied. And those nerves are, are conveying itch, pain, temperature dysregulation, I mean, all sorts of sensations that patients are experiencing as well. So let's talk about the burden of disease in pyrigonagularis. I like this figure because it ties in a few different things. Uh, most importantly, that itch scratch cycle of PN and the constant pruritus, but also sleep disturbance. Uh, to me, the, the pruritus and the sleep disturbance mirror one another. If you're not you know, if you're itching all day, then you're likely not going to be sleeping. And if you're not sleeping, you're actually much more likely to have anxiety, depression, other psychological comorbidities, and also psychosocial disturbances. I had one patient recently, actually my fellows are here, they probably re remember this, who, you know, had pyrigonagularis, and they were clear, and then they got off their therapy uh, because they, you know, just couldn't get an appointment and the prior off had elapsed. And they told me, I was very surprised at this, they told me that their, her boyfriend dumped her because her lesions came back. And then I was like, well, you know, doesn't that speak to this guy that he's like probably not, you know, doesn't love you for you, but that's what happened. No, seriously, that's <laughs> yeah. what happened. No, it, it really was, it's crazy because folks think it's an infectious disease. And I've had a lot of patients tell me that other people are avoiding them, and that's a real psychological toll. So when we think about anxiety and depression in pyrigonagularis, let's think less these patients are crazy and more. Who wouldn't be crazy if you have intense itching, you can't sleep? Who wouldn't have anxiety and depression? I know I would. In yeah, that no, I, I think that is a huge point. I mean, I've had similar situations where I have um, patients where it's like family counseling, you know, which again, as a dermatologist, you're seeing 20, 30 people in a half day. You don't necessarily have the time for it, but it's, you know, the, they don't want to be seen in public if somebody's like scratching or picking or that's how they view it. And it can be a lot of pressure on, on the, the, you know, the patient themselves. And, and one of the craziest parts of the whole thing is I have folks who, who come see me, and I'm sure they come see you, Serena, and I think we actually talked about this earlier, but they come to me and they're like, okay, uh, what do I have? And I'm like, oh, well, you have you know, nodules or, or skin lesions, you have pruritus, signs of scratching, you have pyrigonagularis, and then they start crying. And they're crying because, you know, they'd never been given a diagnosis. They thought that they were crazy, but many folks had told them it's all in your head. So sometimes, you know, folks, like this one lady, I remember her telling me, I put cotton gloves on my hands and I taped them. And then I was going to sleep. And then, you know, it's really like hell for these patients. And even getting a diagnosis, it boggles my mind how some of these folks go 10 plus years and they, and they haven't even gotten, you know, the right diagnosis yet. So let's hear from actually one of my patients about their pathway to getting diagnosis. So the first dermatologist I saw, because I saw several, um, he did a thorough examination and at first they, he originally thought it was maybe some extreme form of eczema, but something was bothering him in the fact that the nodules were just kind of placed in weird locations around my body. So he didn't want to just leave it there and he sent me for a whole battery of tests. Um, some that were pretty scary, so he sent me for tests like HIV, lymphoma, um, we did a blood cell count. So 
The mental capacity and headspace I was in when I was going through this process was pretty extreme, but the first doctor really tried his best to figure it out, but he did not diagnose me. So I was referred to an additional dermatologist um, who um, elevated the situation. He sent me for even more additional tests. He retested me for some of the exams, I, the labs I'd already had, which was also a scary situation. In total, I saw three dermatologists. From the time I saw the first dermatologist to my last and final dermatologist who finally was able to diagnose me, it was 11 months. It was almost a year. So going through the entire process of, you know, being evaluated and diagnosed and referred to other dermatologists and taking all these batteries of labs and tests, it was an incredibly, it was mentally draining. Um, but what I can say is when I was finally diagnosed in August 2022, the feeling of being able to have an answer meant everything. So it highlights the impaired quality of life. Also, these patients have the sleep de deprivation, as we discussed, the emotional impact. And she highlighted one important issue. So she talked about lab testing. And I think this is a little bit of a confusing topic, so we're going to clarify. We're also going to get Serena's take on this. But a lot of dermatologic conditions you know, have been associated with pariconagularis, like atopic dermatitis, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, heart failure, uh, chronic hepatitis, even lymphoma rarely. And so these are some of the, the data that I was referring to in terms of comorbidities. Uh, you can see depression there, also congestive heart failure, so some systemic diseases, chronic kidney disease. What's interesting is a lot of people talk about psoriasis and their comorbidities, but across all of these comorbidities, pariconagularis tends to have a higher disease burden. One of the issues that we are seeing with these patients is that folks are doing a workup, looking for what they think is an underlying etiology. And they're either finding something or not finding something. And if they find something, they're trying to correct it versus initiating early therapy. And I think we are aligned that we believe that's a mistake. I think that a lot of dermatologists, not their fault, we're just, we were all taught incorrectly that pariconagularis has to be due to something else, but actually it can present as an independent disease and be associated with disease comorbidities. So we really want to avoid that delay in treatment that we're seeing all the time from a lot of these referrals. What's your take, Serena? Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think when, when really when you're seeing patients with chronic itch, because itch can be a manifestation of so many different things and parigonodularis is no different. There is this feeling of, well, can I pin it down on one thing and what am I missing? Again, I don't want to miss the cancer patient. I don't want to miss the person who has, you know, when they have flushing pheochromocyte, like the, you have that fear, right? That you're missing something. And so in that initial evaluation, it makes sense, you know, to, to kind of just you know, dot your I's and cross your T's. However, that making the mistake of waiting for that full panel of workup before you are initiating therapy, and we really do tend to kick the can, you know, down the road with this disorder in particular. Part of that is because the current treatments, which I'll talk about later, are you know, potentially toxic, right? They have, they have, you know, you know, repercussion side effects that are not always something we really relish. And, you know, as the landscape changes towards medications that are actually, you know, proven to be effective in a large, you know, population of these patients or subset of these patients and that are safe, have a really good safety profile, I think it'll be easier for us to, to want to treat earlier. And we'll, we'll come back to that point. But I think it's, it is important that we don't ignore what's happening because especially with these patients under so much stress, it just makes their disease worse when you don't treat them. Absolutely. And when we think about quality of life, the other thing to take into account is if you look at folks' overall quality of life, this is from our patients, this study that you're looking at right now, where we uh, administered questionnaires and saw the impact on their quality of life. You can actually appreciate that the overall impact of pregnant is in the same ballpark with heart failure, stroke, uh, even Parkinson's disease, all of these diseases you wouldn't actually you know, expect it to be so severe. And I'm having a lot of patients come to me and they're saying, you know, uh, my friends, my family, they, they say, oh, you're just itchy, and they laugh. Uh, honestly, even being someone who treats itch patients, my, my folks, uh, my, my friends in, in other aspects of medicine or society even say, oh, you're, you, you're an itch doctor, and they laugh. 
So it's like really we're minimizing this, this symptom and the effect on quality of life. Are, are you seeing that, Serena, with your Oh, patients? I see it. In fact, I'm a little mad about it right I'm now. I'm mad about it too. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 was at, I was at some swanky L.A. party for something I don't belong at. Oh, that sounds fun. I told this actress that I was an itch doctor, and she was one of my favorite actresses, and she literally laughed at me. And I even said, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to be doing this. I really hope you're never itchy because I have a two-year wait list. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not doing you any favors. But um, either way, I mean, I think people undervalue how profoundly impactful chronic itch really is until they have it. Doctors are actually sometimes the worst too, um, when, until they get itchy and then they come and see you and they're like, I never knew how bad this was. Absolutely. And we'll get the video all queued up to talk about early treatment. Um, when I met with the first dermatologist, he actually gave me the 0.5% steroid topical and he also did um, put me on gabapentin for the itching. It was also a temporary relief, but again, wasn't long-term, so after a couple of hours, I had started itching again. I didn't have any negative reactions to any of them. My only downside of all of the medications and topicals that they put me on was that they were temporary. Um, I appreciated the relief, but after a couple of hours, the itching came back and it was really severe. So let's go back uh, for a second and talk about differential diagnosis. There's a lot of terms for prognagularis. Uh, I'm you know, more of a lumper than a splitter. So perforating disorders, Curly's disease, sometimes can be very um, you know, exo, exophytic and scaling. I, I believe that you know, can fall into uh, categories of prognagularis as well. Hypertrophic lichen planus, uh, which can be very violaceous, especially in skin of color patients, hard to appreciate. Uh, atopic derm with lichen simplex chronicus. Actually, in particular, skin and color patients, black patients with atopic dermatitis tend to develop more secondary prognodules, and papular eczema, uh, papular eczema in, in general, they tend to develop. Autoimmune blistering diseases, so uh, bullous pemphigoid can present. What I would say is look for urticarial lesions or hives, that's usually their cue. We talked about excoriation disorder. Then there's also other categories, so skin picking syndromes, body repetitive behaviors. If you hear bugs, if someone brings in a bag, it's going to be a yeah, long patient encounter. And then multiple keratoacanthomas is something that's really interesting. So I had a patient recently where the oncologist was like, hey, I'm about to start immunotherapy, a PD-1 inhibitor. I want you to just quickly take a look at this patient. And I was like, okay, sure. So I looked at this patient and the thought was, they came in with a diagnosis of 200 squamous cells on their body. And they had a, a path read it, derm path read it, and they said, oh, this is clearly, you know, squamous cell carcinoma. And then the docs saw so many of them, they referred to the, you know, the Hopkins Oncology Center. This patient was about to have PD-1 therapy. And then I saw them, and it was paragonagulars. Mm-hmm. Actually, there's a lot of similarities between a keratoacanthoma and a paragonagul, but the itch is our defining feature. So distinguishing between PN and other diseases, when you look at the squamous cell carcinoma in particular, it can be really uh, difficult because of that you know, large degree of acanthosis. That's why, in general, I don't actually rely too much on a biopsy. To me, it's a clinical diagnosis. Itch, skin lesions, uh, and, and, and that's pretty much how, how I do it. Is that how you do it? Yeah, and I think the you know the consensus in the U.S. and internationally is that this is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, we, you know, we've talked about this before, but the role of biopsy is usually to rule out those other things. If you can't distinguish between like a hypertrophic LP or or a, a you know a keratoacanthoma, or you're looking for other comorbid diseases, but it's really not to to rule in PN, it's to rule out other things. <clears throat> Absolutely. So that pretty much summarizes our approach. If you need to do it, especially if you're, you're trying to rule out a, a bolus disease, then you can get that direct immunofluorescence if you need it. Now to work up. Uh, so when I'm seeing these patients, uh, you know, you can tell if they're, they're really itching a lot. I personally use a 10-point scale uh, for itch, where zero is no itch or 10 is the worst. You don't have to do that, but that's one of the things that I use. I try to get a sense for how many nodules there are. So, you know, is it really less than 20, 20 to 100, over 100? I'm trying to look for the, the ballpark for that. Those are all important things. 
In terms of labs, a complete blood count with differential liver and, and kidney function tests, I think you need to get because we know these patients can uh, have concomitant uh, diseases and also, depending on the therapies you choose, uh, they may have side effects that affect those organs. So I think that's really important to consider. And there's also potentially thyroid function tests, diabetes assessment. And then for me, it's mostly just risk factor um, on a case-by-case -case -case basis. I'm ordering HIV or hepatitis B and C if those uh, conditions are, you know, something that we're concerned about. And if malignancy is suspected, then... You, know, you can go through a workup, but we recently published a paper about this, and when folks have chronic itch or pregnenolytics, they're actually at the greatest risk for malignancy less than a year, and in particular, you know, three months or six months after the itch starts. If they've had the disease for five to ten years, their risk of malignancy approaches that of the normal population. So I don't do malignancy workups unless you know, they have some B symptoms or other, you know, symptoms they're re reporting usually. I think the timing is very important for me. Uh, and you could really do a million dollar workup in terms of labs. I prefer to keep it simple. Do you, do you also? Sir? Yeah, I think the review of systems is the most important, most important part of evaluating a parigo patient when you're trying to identify what the risk factors are and what you need to be worried about, more so than any lab test, in part because it informs what you're going to evaluate. And then we talked a little bit about all the scales. I mean, there's so many scales, it's overwhelming. And we don't have time. A lot of folks aren't doing a lot of these things. But so the average and the worst itch numeric rating scale, there's also something called the peak paritis numeric rating scale. Uh, I kind of use those because it's, it's, it's great to see, also to document something, because somebody could say, oh, I'm not doing that much better. But then whatever they told you their worst itch was could be a lot better. So I usually just document that in the chart. Uh, there's some other scales, like the Prago activities uh, score, that pretty complex, so you're not going to be doing that at the bedside, but just to mention a few of these that you'll see in clinical trials. So let's go to video about the impact of disease. Parago nodularis has completely changed my life, um, not only physically, but mentally and socially. Um, from a physical standpoint, the itching has been a little bit relieved over the last few months but it still comes and goes in waves. There are days that are really difficult to take where I'll be on camera in meetings and have to turn my camera off because I'm scratching so much. Um, from a, a mental standpoint, going through the testing, going through almost a year of not knowing what this condition was, how it was affecting me, if it was going to interfere with any of my other underlying conditions was really a difficult time for me. Um, but from a social standpoint, I'm single. So, <laughs> you know, I from going outside just regularly in the summer, you know, I would avoid wearing shorts and skirts because I have a lot of concentration on my legs with the black circles and nodules. I have concentration on my arms, so I just started wearing short sleeves. So it has affected my daily life and how I dress. And as I stated, also being single, it affects my daily life and being able to date and meet people because this is going to be a part of a conversation whenever you meet someone new. And you know, I actually rarely see uh, scars uh, in atopic dermatitis. You do see it, especially as skin of color patients, if it's dispigmented, th that we see scars. But the scars in pregonagularis are, are way worse. And so that's another really important reason why early treatment's important, early recognition and diagnosis. This is actually, you know, in dermatology, one of the few situations where if you just make the right diagnosis, you can dramatically alter the course of someone's life. So... Uh, that's the most important uh, thing that I consider uh, in terms of diagnosis and recognition. And we're going to hand it over to Serena now to talk a little bit more about therapeutics and management. That's great. Thanks so much, Sean. Okay, so let's start. Um, you feel free to jump in as things come, come up. So I am really excited to be able to talk with you about kind of the changing and promising therapeutic landscape. I think as you've heard us allude to, there has been 
really we've had decades of very little impact uh, in this disorder that leads to frustration, not only on the patient side, but even on the physician side. And so I think, and families and, you know, really everyone involved in the, you know, in the, the spectrum of this disorder. So we have tried to lay out very clear treatment goals. The first being to reduce itch, right? We want to reduce pruritus uh, and thereby interrupt the itch scratch cycle. So, you know, for some of these patients, as we start to understand how to, to subclassify them, you're going to have the patients who really have those robust nodules that where the itch scratch cycle clearly contributes to the ongoing nature of that nodule, but that patient may still have a, a predisposition towards forming more aggressive nodules than another subtype of patient where they may still have an itch scratch cycle contributing, but they have less of a nodule. So reducing the itch and the itch scratch cycle really helps begin that healing of the um, nodular lesion itself. Now, in the future, we may see that um, you can actually do this you can actually affect the nodule without necessarily affecting itch. And there are some patients where that happens. So there are even subtypes that we have yet to understand in this disorder. But typically, you know, the itch is really just such a hallmark feature in the development of this. So let's um, hear a little bit about just the, the again, the emotional and mental impact um, before we move on into the therapies. When I think about the last almost 18 months that I've been dealing with this condition, and even though I did have a complete sigh of relief when I finally got a name to my condition, the mental turmoil is a lot. There were days where my mental capacity of dealing with it was stronger than worrying about the actual nodules and the disease itself. So what I would recommend to some patients, if you really feel like you're dealing with this from a really deep mental space, get, some, get a mental specialist, go talk to someone, get a therapist, talk to a friend who is supportive, talk to a family member who you know wants to help you through this because I've had that support system and it has made a tremendous difference in my life. So if you need to marry your medical support with a mental support, make sure you do it. You owe it to yourself to give you that space to deal with it and be able to deal with it properly. Yeah, and so before we move into the actual therapies, I think this is an incredible point um, that this patient is, is emphasizing, that part of the management of these patients is recruiting multidisciplinary care, not necessarily just for comorbid disease if they happen to have HIV, renal disease, cardiac disease, but really um, this... Uh, you know, emphasis on, on um, support groups and getting a therapist. And it's, it's as integral to, I think, even coping with the disorder once you're better. If you happen to be on any of these medications and it really benefits you, there's almost like a PTSD associated with this disorder where even when patients have been clear, they're like, they're afraid. They're so afraid of having that itch come back. And so I think that's a really incredible point to recognize. Do you actually have like a referral pattern for, for your patients with PN? Yeah, you know, it, it's it's difficult on a case by case basis. Uh, you know, I, I actually tried very hard to get a particular psychologist or a psychiatrist who could be linked up with these patients because that's the biggest thing we see is how it's wrecked their lives, their emotional uh, relationships, and uh, anxiety and depression. Uh, but you know, it, I'm having a hard time also finding, and that's a tertiary care center. I'm having a really hard time finding some specialists who are also interested in treating each patients have specialty expertise. Did you, did you have that when you were? Uh, yeah. And I also think the other fine line you walk is sometimes when you tell somebody who doesn't own up to the, they, they'll admit they have depression and anxiety, but they don't want to be sent to a psychiatrist specifically because they're worried that they'll be labeled as it being the cause of their disorder. So I feel like that just has to be part of the conversation uh, up front. But, you know, even just with the pandemic and the whole mental health kind of burden, I, I think people are actually a little bit more open-minded to it. They're 
there's been more conversation around that, but it's important, again, to this patient population. So I'm, I'm excited now to kind of jump into our treatment ladder. So this ladder that you see in front of you, on the left side, there's um, kind of neural targeting drugs, and on the right side, you have um, kind of immunotherapy and immunosuppressive drugs. And this, uh, this specific tier that you're looking at, or ladder that you're looking at, it came out of a U.S. consensus um, panel of um, of itch experts who manage a lot of PN patients. And essentially, you can move up and down either side of the ladder or both in conjunction to meet wherever your patient is. Now, most patients, if any, if you are familiar with managing this, like they pretty much fail tier one pretty quickly once they have anything other than localized disease. Fewer than five nodules, more than two or three areas of the body. So, you know, we can try to to use combinations of topical, you know, steroids and calcineurin inhibitors, um, even, you know, newer topical jack inhibitors, but also um, these neuromodulators, if you ever lose lidocaine uh, or even capsaicin, which can be a difficult topical to use. Once you pass the topicals, you're really starting to look at more systemic or widespread treatment. And on the immune arm, that really tends to involve a lot of phototherapy that's still used quite frequently for this condition. And it actually works okay. Um, again, I think in conjunction with other, with other therapies, but um, we also use a lot of methotrexate, cyclosporin, you know, in the past. And then moving up that ladder, we have dupilumab, which we'll talk about in a moment. I think that's, you know, with the FDA approval of dupilumab, that's kind of shifted now to tier two. Uh, and, and there are other drugs coming down the line that are, um, you know, very helpful in manage, appear to be very helpful in their management of, of PN. When you're addressing the neural side of these um, agents, which I'm a huge fan of, actually, in conjunction with the immune dysregulation, uh, or focusing on the immune dysregulation, we um, employ a series of drugs, whether it's mostly, you know, kind of utilizing gabapentinoids at different um, concentrations, uh, antidepressants, SSRIs, SNRIs, or um, tricyclic antidepressants, and, um, you know, a series of other, of other agents. As you move up the tiers, there's less evidence for the these, these different drugs. And I will say one blanket statement is that this particular ladder, most of the data, with the exception of dupilumab, IL-31 inhibitors, and NK1 antagonists, there have been no real randomized controlled trials, double-blind, you know, um, placebo-controlled trials. And so this is all case series, case reports, you know, cohorts, uh, really small sampling. So the, the level of evidence is actually not that great. And as I mentioned before, in 2022, the FDA approved dupilumab as the first therapy, not just the first biologic, but the first therapy for um, parigonodularis. So as I said, you know, I think that we're bumping dupilumab down to kind of that first line systemic um, tier. Now, I just want to talk about what that, the data that supported the FDA approval, that was the PRIME and PRIME-2 trials for parigonodularis. This uh, relied, um, there, were, there were, again, these two trials, or 311 um, patients that were evaluated in these trials combined. They had standard dupixent dosing, 600 milligrams um, sub-Q loading, followed by 300 milligrams every two weeks. The trial lasted 24 weeks weeks and, um, again, was placebo-controlled, the trials, I should say. Uh, it is important to note that these patients were allowed to enroll in the trial if they were using topical steroids or calcineurin inhibitors and were able to continue use of those throughout, so not necessarily monotherapy. The primary outcome that was evaluated in this, um, these trials were the proportion of patients with a, a four-point or more improvement in their worst itch numeric rating scale score. And then key secondary outcomes were looking at the proportion of patients that got either a zero or a one um, on an investigator global assessment um, scale at 24 weeks. The, another secondary um, 
uh, endpoint was looking at the proportion of patients that actually achieved both the improvement in the NRS scale as well for a four-point NRS scale move as well as the um, IGA PN improvement of zero to one. So looking at these pooled results, I'll just quickly review that there was the two to four week screening period, 24 weeks of treatment, 12 weeks of follow-up. And the, the itch severity score, which we've alluded to, is really rated from zero to uh, 10 with the worst itch imaginable. And the PN stage or IgA um, score uh, for, for PN stage, which I think probably most of you are less familiar with, you can have a zero or one, which means you have five or less nodules, um, two is just six to 10 nodules, three is three and four or 20 or greater. And the enrollment criteria for this, these trials were that you had to have a worst itch score at baseline of over seven, your NRS score had to be over seven, and your IgA PN score had to be three or four, which means you had to have at least 20 nodules. Now, when we look at the pooled results, again, um, we, uh, the, the, the trials ran over 24 weeks, but we see even at the 12-week time point that in the dupilumab arm, 40, approximately 40% 40 of patients achieved a four-point reduction on their itch scale in the dupilumab arm versus only 19% in the placebo arm. Uh, those numbers improved from there, where uh, actually almost 60% of patients improved by week 24 in the dupilumab arm, and, and the numbers for placebo stayed the same at 19. When we look at that nodule count, or the investigator global assessment score, uh, even at 12 weeks, we're seeing about 28, 29% of dupilumab patients were improved compared to 12 on placebo, and then up to around 46% um, when we get to uh, the 24-week the data. Now, when we look at the combined score, that means we have patients where their itch was better, their nodules were better. It's a, it's a more rigorous bar uh, to, to have both of these um, together. And what we see is that in the dupilumab arm, at 12 weeks, we had 18% of patients who achieved that mark, and up to 35, so a third of patients um, had achieved that mark at the 24-week, compared to you know, 7 to 8% in the placebo arm. So for a, a, a population that has such refractory disease, you know, patients who are on cyclosporin, who are on thalidomide, you know, these are, you know, this is really starting to change the conversation, I think, around how we get these patients better. And, you know, we'll talk about this more, but this is actually where the field for other agents is also moving. And I think that's really important. How do you, how do you feel about these data? I mean, We've been relying on completely nonspecific therapies that are very toxic. And these patients are older, they're middle-aged, older adults. Oftentimes they have a lot of disease comorbidities, hypertension, kidney disease, et cetera. I, I remember not long ago we were doing cyclosporin and uh, it's just tough to manage in these patients and having very targeted therapies. Uh, I'm, I'm honestly, I always get goosebumps at the age that we're living in. Like who even thought there'd be any drug development for pariganagularis. Even like five, 10 years ago, like I never would have imagined it. Like there's even drug development. It's a remarkable time. And I tell all my patients, it's, it is and it will continue to be the best time in history, the golden age for anybody to have pariganagularis. So I honestly still always get goosebumps even thinking about the, the amount of development we're happening that's happening right now. And also there's a lot of respect to the pharmaceutical companies who took all are taking chances to do these trials in these, this patient population has been so neglected for so long. Yeah, it's a pretty scary population, actually, uh, to, to try to, to impact, and I think this is really promising. The one thing I will mention is that for dupilumab, uh, for those of you who are familiar using it for atopic dermatitis, it does have a favorable safety profile. Um, so we're not simply talking about um, not having to deal quite with the severity of you know, potential cyclosporin renal toxicity, but we're, you know, we, we are, you know, 60% of patients on the dupilumab arm did have some type of, you know, adverse event, but it was, they were all mild, they were essentially manageable, and they, it was, you know, typical, like, you know, nasopharyngitis and, um, and herpes 
you know, um, eruptions, which are very manageable. And we saw that same type of uh, safety profile in the um, in in atopic patients as well. So I think, you know, your comfort level, if you've already been giving dupixin or dupilumab, really kind of extends to its use even in PN patients, which is good to know. So uh, there have been some additional studies and some post hoc analysis in the, of these uh, patients. And in the dupilumab treated patients, there was an improvement in the skin lesions as well, as I mentioned. It trailed behind improvement of itch, and I think we expect that to, to some extent. It does, you know suggest that there could be, it all could be due to improvement in itch, but there's additional data and evolving data that suggests that it's also really impacting skin remodeling and that a lot of the newer biologics and agents might have kind of a dual effect or a multi-pronged um, impact on the skin in this disorder. Uh, you know, one other thing to highlight is post hoc analysis shows that dupilumab even works in the setting of patients who had been on immunosuppressive therapy, whether steroids, cyclosporin, phototherapy use. And again, that may mean that there is something else about how we're using these drugs to modulate more than just inflammation that is leading to the improvement in these patients. Okay, so um, I also wanted to just quickly highlight the fact that, you know, in, in separate data, a registry that is out of um, Sweden, they were looking at PN patients who have been treated with dupilumab. They're following them um, thus far over up to uh, beyond 16 months, a median of 16 months, and they found that there is an improvement even after three months of treatment in their paritis NRS scores, um, that in their dermatology life quality of, um, of life index, um, as well as depression scores. The um, the the Montgomery, uh, what is it? Montgomery Aberg. Can't remember exactly what it is, but it's a it's a ten point depression scale um, that captures the severity of of depression that's widely used. And so, really across the board, we're seeing uh, being able to achieve those those um, landmarks for treatment therapy that we had talked about. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly talk about some of the additional treatments that are still as of now the supported by low evidence but widespread use uh, for these um, you know for parigonodularis. I'm gonna actually move past topical therapy for the reasons that we discussed and that it's really a kind of of limited utility. In the rare exception that you have somebody with an isolated nodule, are there any other cases that you'll use topical therapy in PN patients? Okay. Um, I will bring, I'll highlight at the bottom of the, of the immunologic therapies here, you see that we use sometimes cryotherapy, uh, followed by intralesional steroids. That actually can be helpful in some of these patients. So, you know, it's not to say that, that just because it's only supported by a case report, there hasn't been some, we haven't seen improvement in some patients, but it's certainly just, it's only doable if you have a very limited lesion count. I, I, I like doing the intralesional steroids with some lidocaine, uh, even uh, bupivacaine, maybe, like a longer acting anesthetic working together. I think that I mean, we, we've all seen it, who have seen patients that intralesional therapy can be really helpful. So even folks who I have on a lot of these systemic therapies, they'll still have a few remaining nodules and then do some, you know, intralesional therapy. Very helpful, I think. Yeah. And and here on this screen, you know, one of the other um, second tier uh, recommendations was for, um, was for uh, phototherapy. And while I do think, you know, there's clearly data for narrowband UVB as well as PUVA, but one thing I would highlight is, you know, for those, again, in indiv indiv patients who struggle with a few residual individual lesions after you may have cleared them in other ways, um, eczema, like an excisomer, Excimer laser is actually not a bad idea in that type of um, scenario. So I want to just take one moment more to really address some of the systemic neural therapies. These are therapies that have relatively favorable tolerability. And what I mean by that is almost every neural targeting drug you're going to use is going to have some type of sedation or anticholinergic effect, particularly in the PN population, which is older. They tend to be on multiple medications that can also have anticholinergic effects. And so you have to be um, a bit careful about using these, but I do still to this day find them very helpful, even 
of my patients actually who are treated with dupilumab or methotrexate or the few I have that are still on cyclosporin um, before we, we transition them. And I, I, I frequently use them as adjunctive agents. I personally really like using gabapentinoids. I feel um, pretty comfortable managing these as long as you can address some of that you know, sedation, preempt questions about sedation, uh, and make sure that your patient is safe starting these kind of slowly and then um, upregulating your, up titrating your, your dose is a very good idea with those. There's also limited data for, as I said, serotonin norepinephrine um, inhibitors or antagonists like duloxetine and even mirtazapine, also tricyclics uh, like amitriptyline, and I will sometimes personally use nortriptyline, it's tolerated a little better. Uh, you see here at the bottom of this list some neurokinin-1 antagonists, and as I mentioned before, while there were isolated case reports and this expectation for uh, neurokinin-1 antagonists to, um, to really have a profound effect on this disorder, in part because of preclinical data, but also because of isolated case reports, the randomized control trial with serlopatent uh, failed to meet its primary endpoint. So that um, we have essentially kind of taken off of this list. In turn, I've you know, alluded to the fact that my two mainstays for severe patients prior to dupilumab's approval was our methotrexate and cyclosporin. I actually still use a lot of methotrexate, even when I have somebody where monotherapy with dupilumab or monotherapy with a neuromodulator like a pregabalin or gabapentin doesn't have a strong enough impact, and I'm trying to tweak that immune um, side of the disease. Do you, do you use a lot of methotrexate too? too? Yeah, absolutely. Especially folks who may not have the best insurance. I usually start methotrexate 15 milligrams weekly. One really interesting thing we've found is that subcutaneous methotrexate seems to have better bioavailability. So I've been doing more and more of the subcutaneous methotrexate, and I've been having a little bit better results. And you're right. And it could be, you know, in folks who don't have good insurance, it could be in combination with diplomat. But I oftentimes do methotrexate and phototherapy together. Uh, plus other things. So I think it's it's still, you know, very important to know about. And I think we use it for other indications. So it's something we feel comfortable with. I hate using cyclosporin, especially in this day and age. Yeah. Well, I mean, I agree with that. I love using cyclosporin, but oh. there's not as much of a need for it yeah. <laughs> anymore, which is a good thing. So, um, so here is a list of some of the, of, these were medications uh, on the neural side that were either, uh, that were either less tolerable or less well established. So even less literature out there supporting their use. There are um, cap, uh, there, there are mu opioid modulators. So either mu antagonists like naltrexone or butorphanol, which is a kappa agonist. These are, these actually can be helpful in some patients. However, they are often met um, with uh, a lot of side effects, headaches, nausea, GI uh, side effects that are sometimes challenging to manage. And ongoing trial or, or trials looking at these drugs for various itch, including um, parigonodularis, but various itch conditions have also kind of borne that out, making them a little bit more limited in their use. Thalidomide, I don't know how many of you guys actually have ever used thalidomide. Um, I mean, there's always a few, and it really it's a drug that can work incredibly well, but again, is met with a lot of toxicity in many patients. It actually can induce a peripheral neuropathy. You have to monitor it. You can't use it in, you know, any patient who may become pregnant if, you know, who's interested in doing that because of the teratogenicity. And um, even when you're going to lose lenalinamide, um, you know, just having to be in the registration, you know, program can sometimes be a hindrance to people. So, Moving to now, what again will kind of move down to, to tier two, I believe, with dupilumab, we have we have obviously the data that we just presented. There's also nemalizumab, which will just read out its phase three uh, trials. And actually, I'm going to plug, Sean's going to be talking about that at the late breaking sessions on Saturday morning. So um, they'll, they'll be talking about that. Uh, but that is an IL-31 antibody that has also, you know, I think going to help move the needle for this disorder. Um, finally, we have some, some, you know, 
just this slide kind of acknowledging that there are other agents under investigation. Um, many of us use other drugs that are just off-label. For example, I actually think cannabinoids can be very helpful for this disorder. Uh, you know, I think there needs to be more rigorous evaluation of how the nodules and the, the symptoms of PN, including itch, burning, stinging, and pain, respond to these types of neuromodulators. But I do um, think that there is promise there for some of those and actually, some of your patients who have PN may already be using cannabinoids themselves to manage their symptoms. So um, this is just, you know, another list for emerging therapies. If you are, are uh, so interested that are moving far enough along and really, again, helping us shape our understanding of this neuroimmune epithelial and really, you know, fibrosis <laughs> spectrum, fibroblast spectrum. And, you know, do you have any, before we jump to just questions, did you have any, you know, burning comments that you wanted to make? In terms of approach to treatment, you're really trying to, you know, feed two birds with one scone. Kill. That's PETA approved, uh, right? Yeah, oh, feed. The feed All two right, birds with one scone. And the, like, two, <laughs> and the two birds are, you know, the nodules, the, the itch in the nodules, right? That's really what we're focused on here. And so therapies that are going to have effects on both of those are what we want to utilize. And sometimes you use a therapy and you still have some nodules. So that, that's really my focus is even when folks come back, you know, uh, you're taking a look at the nodules, you're assessing their itch. That's really the endpoints that we should all be looking at every visit. And so I'll tune folks up with some intralesional steroids. I'll start phototherapy adjunctively at the Trex, any of these kind of things if we're seeing some disease activity. So I think knowing more about the toolbox can really help us. Yeah, I agree. I think you're always going to have to reach into your toolbox for something because the other, you know, aspect of this that we haven't, we don't even know yet about is can you, you know, can you cure this? Can you get it under control where to the point where you really are disease modifying, where you're remitting disease? And there, you know, there is a hope, I think, and some data to even maybe support that, where once you stop some of these drugs, where these patients have a persistent period of improvement, uh, that is very exciting. You know, to even, you know, where, where psoriasis was 20 years ago, where like at, the data was just getting better and better and better. And again, you didn't have to use methotrexate or, or cyclosporin. And I think that's a real, um, it's just a, such a time of excitement for for us who see a lot of this, and you who are going to have more of these patients actually come into your office as the educational efforts and awareness of PN you know grows. Okay, so let's shift to the audience Q and A. We don't have a ton of time, but we have a lot of questions. So the first question I'll take this: So does it present differently in various ethno uh, ethnic and uh, demographic groups? So you know I practice in inner city Baltimore. And I see a lot of uh, diverse PN patients. And one of the observations we made early on is that, especially in African-American patients, we see an incredible degree of fibrosis and thickening of these nodules that we think you know, is a very unique presentation. When we looked in the blood of PN patients, African-American patients, they tended to have a little bit wider cytokine involvement as well as in the skin. Actually, one of my fellows is here today is we're, we're looking at the genetics of these nodules in different ethnic groups. And one of the things that we found was that there's actually increased you know, genetic features of fibrosis. So uh, some genes affecting the epithelial to mesenchymal uh, transition. So I think that we're going to be learning more. I absolutely think that one of the unfortunate things is, is all trials that are performed right now in dermatology have less diversity. And so we're gonna to have to use our real world experience to know how effective some of these therapies are in different groups. So you know, we're looking at that right now as well. So that's one of the important things to, to consider. Mm -hmm. Serena, next question to you. Uh, how to manage pregnant in a developing country with limited resources? Yeah, I mean, that can actually be a, a, I think, a real challenge. And I have had to do that when I've had, you know, consults from patients who are not necessarily from here or don't have, you know, um, quite this set up for access. I, you know, methotrexate is a widely, widely used drug and it is available um, throughout the world. So it is one of the, the medications that I will frequently use. I've had, there's more variability I've found with different neuromodulators uh, in terms of access to, you know, even gabapentin 
dependent, even topicals for that matter, can actually be a challenge outside of, of the U.S. Um, so one of the things I do there is resort actually to behavioral strategies where I will have, if a patient has you know access to literally something as simple as a, a white cotton t-shirt or white pajamas, you know, just like a, a, you know, cotton pajamas that they can put in water or in a freezer or something before they go to bed. Like they'll take it out, they'll put it on. Um, we use those types of strategies. We also talk about, you know, like kind of as opposed to in really working on that itch scratch cycle, kind of like pressing, you know, those types of behavioral interventions that don't, I mean, they have some impact, right? But I think it's hard to escape the need for um, having some type of therapy. So if you can identify access to whether it's a tricyclic antidepressant or SSRIs that have been around gabapentinoids plus methotrexate, that would be my go-to um, for that. And then there are some, you know, there are some people who are able to get compassionate use through their, if they happen to have a care team here, even if they live elsewhere. So that's one thing I can recommend um, as well. But I think that is, you know, clearly a challenging scenario. Awesome. Okay, so we got another question uh, about uh, atopic and non-atopic pariginagularis and differences. Uh, my opinion on this is that we have atopic dermatitis that can develop pariginagules. In terms of PN patients, some of them may have a remote history of atopic dermatitis or mild atopic dermatitis. They may have a history of allergic rhinitis or asthma. I don't think that's as relevant as type 2 inflammation. So one thing I actually recently started getting myself uh, for patients ordering is uh, you know a complete blood count with a differential to see the blood eosinophil percentage. And oftentimes now I'm ordering an IgE, and I'll tell you why. This is not necessarily recommended or anything, but I do it because IgE to me is a biomarker of type 2 inflammation. So for chronic itch patients and pregonagularis patients, I'm ordering a complete blood count and getting an IG. It's not perfect, but when those are elevated, that's pretty much confirmation that there's type 2 inflammation that's going on. So I have a lot of patients who are in their 40s, their 50s. They don't even have a history of you know, atopic dermatitis, but then they develop with you know, overwhelming number of eosinophils or IgE, and they do great on either dupilumab or, or other therapies you know, targeting that axis. So I think that's one of the things we're learning actually across diseases. If you look at chronic spontaneous urticaria, if you look at bull's pemphigoid, if you look at itch unknown origin, it's actually one of the common themes of a lot of these different you know, conditions. Do you have anything else? Yeah, I mean, I actually think for that type of analysis, IgE is more sensitive than eosinophils because you can have somebody who still has active allergic disease and not actually have a bump in their EOs. Uh, I, I get them together yeah, as yeah. well, but I, but I agree with that. So one more question, just about thoughts on dupilumab and JAK inhibitors uh, versus JAK inhibitors or thoughts on them. Any experience or thoughts? I mean, I think, you know, I do think JAK inhibitors obviously have a lot of promise for an acute reduction in itch, and that's critical to PN. But when you're talking about an older population where they already, we already saw this higher burden and odds of having multiple cardiometabolic, you know, um, disorders, I have to say that if you're talking about something that's effective, where you're also going to have a, a safety profile where you don't even have to worry about counseling specifically on, on that type of uh, risk. I, I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, I do think the, the concern over JAK inhibitors may be over um, hyped in certain populations, although you need to address it, but this is one. Just like the, the, the patients who really have other, you know, severe psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, hydradenitis suppurativa, you know, much more of a TH1 like and TH17 um, push to their disease, you may be a bit more concerned about that. And I think even if we're thinking about PN as a type 2 dysregulated phenomenon, knowing that that metabolic signature is out there, I think I would always kind of go with the, the safety profile as one of of my lead determinant factors. Uh, thanks everyone so much for you know, your attention. Yeah, thank you guys so much for, for being here, especially hardcore on a Thursday night, which is <laughs> great. So we hope you enjoyed the meeting and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash CDT 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Sanofi and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals.